Perfect to stay on time and, and respect you guys' time. Uh, first of all, thank you all for coming. It's, it's great to see the, the interest and the, and the support you know, going into our new community wildfire protection plan. Uh, my name is Shelby Edwards. I'm the superintendent of Platte Canyon's Wildland Fire Module. Uh, I've been with Platte Canyon for, for 12 years now, so uh, this is kind of in my wheelhouse. And I'm doing nothing more than introducing um, our guest speaker who's going to give you guys the presentation. But uh, just a couple things. There are refreshments in the back. Help yourself to that, please. Uh, bathrooms are out to the left if you haven't found those yet. Um, throughout the meeting, there could be a fire call that comes over to the speakers. If there is, we'll just pause for a moment so everybody can hear. Um, I will be passing around a, a sign-in sheet to record your name and your email, please, just so we can record who came here. It's a dual-purpose sign-up. If you sign up for that, uh, you're going to get on uh, my notification list for prescribed fire. Uh, if if Platte Canyon is conducting any prescribed fire, uh, you'll get this email just as a courtesy notification. So uh, if you could sign up for that. I think if nothing else, this is uh, Karina Marshall with the Forest Stewards no. Guild, and Thank she'll be uh, presenting. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming out. Really appreciate that. Um, also, a good note for that email address is to get a copy when the final PWPP document comes out. Get it sent so you know exactly when it comes. It will be on Black Canyon's website and all of that, but we want it right to you, right on time. Another good plug for that. So um, I'm just going to give a little bit of a context for what we're doing here. This meeting is designed to share some of what is going into the CWPP. It's not going to be comprehensive of the whole thing. That would take way too much of all of our time. Um, but it's meant to be a little bit of a teaser so that you can understand what is in the document, ask questions, and have a final chance for any feedback before the final document is published at the end of the month. Um, we are the, I'm, I'm part of the Forest Stewards Guild. We are a nonprofit organization. We work across the country in different regions, working on different forestry and land management issues. In this region, the Intermountain West, we work exclusively on fire. So we have a wildland fire festival that does prescribed fire, um, a lot like the Black Canyon one. And um, we also help out on suppression. So we have a lot of fire background that we lend to this. Um, and we hope that it uh, makes sense to all of you. And I encourage you to ask questions during the presentation related to what I've talked about, questions you have, terminology you don't know. I don't want you to sit in there not understanding the presentation because I used a term that you're not familiar with. Um, but I've tried to break down some of the ones that I've used more frequently. Um, any questions that are related to kind of larger content or, or things I haven't discussed yet, I'd ask you to please hold till the end of the meeting. I may address them in the presentation, and if I don't, then at the end we can um, see what I can do to answer your questions. So, in general, our meeting objectives are going to be to discuss the findings, go over some of our recommendations at a very broad scale to get the details. You're going to have to read the document, or at least parts of it. And then also to make sure that everyone in this room um, is aware of some of the local resources that you have at your disposal for wildfire mitigation. Um, I see some familiar faces in here who have come to some of the past meetings, but I see a lot of new ones. Um, this one, is, this meeting in particular, is designed to be basic so that you know it's it's understandable even if you've never been involved with wildfire mitigation before. So let's start by going through some basic terms. Um, I just want to go through these, which I think are my most common stumbling blocks. Um, we talk about fuel a lot when we think about wildland fire. So that means either live fuel as vegetation or dead fuels, dry, dead vegetation. Things that are flammable, specifically when we are considering wildland fuels in our analysis, we are not considering structures. So when we talk about wildland fuels or a high fuel load, we mean a lot of vegetation. 
we mean an area in the wildland that might be hard to control if it was um, on fire. It is not referring to gasoline or kind of the, the home materials that are flammable. The reason being, there's no current scientifically approved way to model homes in fire behavior. So we know a lot about how vegetation burns and we can predict what it will look like, the kind of heat it will export, um, but we don't have a scientific model for homes, so that is not included there. <laughs> Just want to make sure we're all clear when I talk about flame length. We're not talking about just something on fire and it goes straight up. <clears throat> Obviously, you all know there's a lot of wind in this area, and so when there are wildland fires happening, flames will lay down with the wind. So when we're thinking about roadway survivability, for example, we're not talking about flame lengths greater than eight feet that are next to the road putting off heat onto the road. We're talking about flame length that could potentially be bending with the wind over a roadway. That will be, I think, helpful baseline for you guys. We modeled for all of Flat Canyon Fire Protection District, radiant heat, short range embers, and long range embers. We're able to model structures that are affected by all three of these. So radiant heat is the amount of heat that you're feeling from a fire. Say you've all, we've all been to a bonfire, felt that, that heat. During a wildland fire, the heat can be so extreme that at a distance, even without direct flame touching your home, it can ignite your home. Another really common, the most common really way that your home is in danger during a wildland fire is through ember cast, both short range and long range. Long range embers in the front range can travel a mile and a half. So if it lands on your home, in your gutters, through your eaves, you can imagine what's going to happen. I actually even have a video here to give you a real sense of why we have felt that ember cast matters so much. Some of you this will be familiar to, but I'd like to show a short, it's a one minute video. Um, just describing how ember cats work for those of you that haven't seen something like this before. All companies on Rikers Division, be advised, fire coming. Most people think wildfires are to blame for the destruction of homes and property. But in reality, in many cases, the culprits are the embers that are carried by the wind ahead of the real fire. And we got some stuff back up here, some embers and glows, and landed on that roof right there. And it's starting on fire. Ember showers are an undeniable threat during any wildfire, big or small. They can travel for miles to homes where they find small spaces around and inside of buildings, hiding and smoldering for hours, even days, before bursting into flames. You can see the black smoke and the fire is spreading. They could hide in a wood pile, behind a trash can, hunker down in the debris on your roof or in the gutters. It takes just one ember to bring a wildfire to your home, to your family. Learn about defensible space. Go to NFPA.org and click on Firewise USA. Erratic winds and erratic fire behavior. Be ready. It's not a question of if, but when. So that none of that's really meant to scare you, but if anyone hasn't kind of been exposed to that before, I want you to know the real danger that structures are at in Platte Canyon um, due to ember wash. And we'll talk a little bit later about some of the recommended home hardening practices. Um, but we are able to map the number of structures in each neighborhood in Platte Canyon that will be at risk of loss due to radiant heat exposure, <laughs> short range ember cast, and long range ember cast. Um, and what I can tell you for sure is that every single home in Platte Canyon is exposed to long range embers. Got a lot of national forest here. It is certainly a possibility. But 
the great news is there's something we can do about it. We can harden our homes. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then I just wanted to walk through red flag warning. I'm sure you all have heard this before, but I wanted to make sure everyone knows what goes into it. Um, it can be, a, it's got to be a dry day with wind gusts greater than 25 miles per hour and a certain fuel moisture content. Basically, your wildland vegetation is dry <coughs> and susceptible to point. Also, you can be thinking about um, wide scattered dry thunderstorms with dry fuel, so the same <coughs> low moisture vegetation. Those are the two options for triggering a, wild, or a red flag day. And I just want to put a little plug here um, we'll talk about evacuation a little bit later and having a plan for being ready to go. But any red flag warning day, be ready to go. <laughs> so I'm going to go through a little bit of some of the underlying stuff that goes into our fire modeling, but I'm not going to go into a lot of depth here. So um, some of the things that we looked at are those flame lengths. We can predict um, how long flame lengths are based on fire weather conditions, which means that on a 90th percentile fire weather condition, it's 10% of the historical fire weather, the worst 10% that ever has happened in this area. So um, we're looking at extreme case scenario here, which is not um, which is something that has happened. These are conditions that have already happened in this area. Uh, and this is the kind of flame length that they can produce. The red here is significant control issues, meaning it would be difficult for wildland firefighters to work on, but over 11 feet of flame length. So that's that flame potentially laying down, moving with the wind that you guys saw an image of before. The kind of tan colors are under eight feet that's still going to be associated with some home damage. That's not to say that, you know, four-foot flame lights don't come with any of their own inherent risks. And then um, here's another example of kind of what goes in beneath the surface of some of our modeling. Taking a look at um, simulating a fire start and taking a look at how large it could get over a three-day burning period. And so these maps are a lot to digest, right? It's the whole district, and it's really hard to begin to prioritize what parts are we going to are we going to work on. Obviously, we've got some we've got some issues below 285, that's for sure, and we'll be talking about that a little bit. Um, but there's also a lot of other areas of pretty high risk and pretty extreme fire behavior. So to break down these analyses into manageable pieces, we took a look at the kind of population centers because <laughs> the U.S. Forest Service has their own plans. They've been meeting with us, and we'll get to some of that later. But they um, are not going to be taking the same types of actions that you all will, and that um, kind of the neighborhood level mitigation actions that need to happen. So we broke down all our analyses by neighborhood and by evacuation <laughs> unit. I'll just show these. I realize that I try to make it as big as possible, but um, I realize that some of these will be hard to identify. Joe Burgett helped us break down all of these neighborhoods. Some of these will not be exactly neighborhoods as you maybe are familiar with. For example, in the Berlin Ranchettes area, we had to make some designations that are not based on subdivision, but are based on topography and fuels, so that vegetation that's in the area. Um, so this is how we've divided it up. Um, you'll see that things like places like Elk Creek Highlands and Meadows, and then the upper 43 area are kind of all combined. Um, this is intentional to be able to give recommendations across these neighborhoods. But you will be able to get in the CWPP zoomed in to some of the individual neighborhoods. And we'll, we'll show you that a little bit. I, I, I brought a zoomed in one. I think it's still hard for people to see. This one is the most congested area. Um, and it doesn't matter too much if you can identify right now today 
where exactly you're at because in the document you will be able to see it with road names and things like that for easier identification. And then very similarly we did evacuation units. <coughs> These are mostly the same with a few differences. Also working with Platte Canyon Fire District, mm -hmm. um, we broke this down so that we could take a look at how long it takes to evacuate from each polygon here. And that will help Joe and the Fire Protection District make staggered evacuation decisions. So that's why we've done it that way. Um, and that's how we are kind of deciding to make this a little bit more manageable. Um, any questions on how we've broken those down? I can see a lot of you trying to figure out maybe where you're at. Yeah. And I, yeah, it's just, it's too small to get it all up on one screen, but I, I, I'll give you an example here in a little bit of what a zoomed in neighborhood looks like. So then we're able to do things like take our district wide radiant heat exposure and bring it into something manageable. So we're able to take a look at number of structures that are affected by radiant heat exposure. We decided to, we think number is a little bit more helpful than percentage. Um, so you can see that in some of these extreme neighborhoods in red, greater than 130 neighborhoods are predicted by our model to be at extreme risk due to radiant heat exposure. Uh, structures. Structures. Yeah. And just a note, I'm kind of on that uh, train of thought. We have a structure map from the county assessor, and we have address points from the county assessor. There, I'm sure there will be structures that are not accounted for by that, but it's the best data that we have available. Yeah, John. So, uh, when you determine the structure based on radiant heat exposure, that's the distance from the structure to the surrounding vegetation, is that how that Yeah, works? so um, here, let me give you perfect. <laughs> So the next slide here. So this is what, uh, I just picked a little wisp just as an example here. Um, but based on the underlying vegetation data, we're able to take a look and run a model that predicts what type of heat is coming off of that vegetation. And then we're able to create a buffer to the structures, which again are probably hard to see, but I can't make it too much bigger, but so that's the structure, this structure there. And you can kind of start to see them dot through. There's parcel lines in there. Um, and so it's a, it's a buffer, basically, to a structure to say these structures are going to be affected by uh, radiant heat exposure. And then orange is short-range spotting potential. Yellow is long-range. The whole thing is underneath there is yellow. I can tell you that. <laughs> Um, but so this is what it will look like where you're going to be able to zoom in, you're going to be able to see road names, and you're going to be able to understand where in your neighborhood needs to be prioritized. So radiant heat exposure means that there is a, the highest fuel loading. Short range spotting potential means there is fuel that should be modified, um, and then long range is going to be beyond neighborhood control. Um, but we don't want to let you forget that you need to have <coughs> in your home because there are, there are fuels further from your home that will need to be mitigated at a district scale. But we'd also like to con convince you all to work at a neighborhood scale for some of these close to home pockets of fuel. We've also taken a look at evacuation. So um, what our model does is it can run from every address point that we have available, and it can tell us the time it takes to get to a evacuation checkpoint that Joe provided us, Chief Forget provided us. Um, it's based on the roadway capacity and speed, we assumed two cars leaving per structure to account for trailers and other non-primary evacuation methods of transport. Though I don't recommend taking your horse trailer during evacuation, but we know it'll happen. Um, 
<laughs> this is based on a high visibility day. So I'm going to show you what some of the times that we've come up with that our model has shown us. But I want you to know that this is a day with no chaos. Everyone's being polite. Nobody has, you know, cut everyone off and caused a traffic accident. Um, I think we all know that that's not the case. We also all know how 285 can be on the weekends, or say you're over by Staunton State Park. There are going to be areas of congestion that are not accounted for in the time to evacuate that you're about to see here. And I want you all to know that this is like driving down the road, listen to music, just easy, going to your evacuation checkpoint, no urgency. Um, and this is going to be how long it really takes. <coughs> I'm a little out of order here, but we'll look at this first since I set it up. Um, so these are those evacuation units that I put up there before. And each address point in those polygons is modeled here. So you see a distribution of points. So if you have a graph that goes like this, it means that most of the homes there are they're evacuating at about the same time. It all takes about the same time. When you see something like, um, let's look, see Guanella Pass, for example, has three distinct distributions of address points in how long it takes to evacuate there. That makes sense, right? There's different areas throughout as they're driving down that are going to take longer through that kind of linear neighborhood. <coughs> so that's what you're looking at here. You're looking at a distribution. We didn't want to be able to tell, say that each individual house, we can, we can model you know, what that address point is predicted to do, but it's much more helpful for Joe and the Fire Protection District to know what's the shortest time and what's the longest time. Again, on a good day, <laughs> on a really good day where you can see what's happening. <laughs> Yeah. Is the assumption here that everybody in the neighborhood got the word? Yes, everyone got the word, everyone left at the same time. They got right in their cars, they didn't dally, they had their go bag ready. Does everyone in here have an evacuation plan? Yes. Yeah. Can I see your show hand? Yeah. Okay. Good group. Good group. It's seniors. Yeah. <laughs> You gotta have one ready because if it's gonna take you 50 minutes to evacuate, you don't really want to wait. So this is these are the evacuation times, sunny day, perfect conditions. You have some sort of an estimate of the rule of thumb. Okay, there's small communities, whatever. What are the more realistic things? So there's. There is a reason why we didn't kind of give an estimate there because there's no measurable scientific basis for how long these things take in reality because it often is it's so widely variable. Um, but in general, it takes people about a half hour to get to their car. So add in half an hour. So then your, your shortest one here from the Shawnee neighborhood is going to take about an hour. <clears throat> and then add a chaos factor of low visibility, reckless drivers, scared, your, your, your brain isn't really working that well because you're, you're panicking. Um, there is some, it's, there's some anecdotal evidence that that is going to add 15 to 25 minutes. Hmm. So if you're if you're living in Shawnee, you could be looking at, um, you know, with 285 backed up on the weekend, with half an hour because you didn't pack your go bag, and um, your neighbor Johnny jackknifed his trailer at the entrance, and you gotta wait for him to get turned around, or somebody to pull him out of a ditch or something, you know, you could quite easily get to an hour and a half. What are these evacuation destinations? So evacuation destinations are the high school, Deer Creek Elementary, and um, Elk Creek Elementary. 
It's just there's a school right over the county line. That's Elk Creek Elementary. Elk Creek Elementary. Those are the three chosen. And those are not, you are going to stay the night there, evacuation locations. Those are checkpoints. Those are not even, they, they may not be the checkpoints the day of, but they are potential ones that were used to run the simulation. The high school, honestly, yeah, that's, that's a place where you could set up an incident command and have a whole bunch of people stay there. There's a lot more room to park people in those fields. Um, the two elementaries, not so much, but they are meant to serve as a, a place of checking through, saying, saying that you're safe, basically, um, as a way to kind of predict the way it might go. So let me back up to, to how this looks, what you'll be able to see in your neighborhood packet. So in the yellow here, we have non-survivable roadways. I mentioned that a little bit before. That's eight feet or greater of plane length over a roadway. It's not survivable. In the campfire, a lot of people were stuck in their cars. And that is kind of the impetus for us modeling non-survivable roadways to identify where roads need to be cleared so that at the very least, people can be evacuated safely. Evacuation pinch points in red is where there's high congestion modeled in evacuation. So that means um, you might be sitting there during an evacuation. So the point here is to show where non-survivable roadways and evacuation pinch points line up. Not a good place to be and is a very clear first priority for your district, for any district. Um, we want you guys to be able to evacuate safely. There are things you can be doing to harden your home, create defensible space, ensure you know firefighters have an easier time in the event of a wildfire when it happens. But we want you to be able to evacuate safely. And there's a lot of places where that might not be the case right now. <clears throat> so that is the number one priority outlined in this CWPP um, and reflects the priority of the Fire Protection District. So these are some of the things that we've put together to help prioritize those neighborhoods. You saw the radiant heat per neighborhood kind of structures diagram. There's one of the, those for each one of these. So we've made an evacuation risk rating and a neighborhood risk rating that will be assigned to each one of those units. So for an evacuation risk rating, that's gonna be about people, right? Risk to people evacuating safely. So it, it's a one to four score for all of these categories. Time to evacuate, non-survivable pinch points. Those are those areas where you're likely going to be sitting in an evacuation for some period of time that are currently not survivable. Shelter in place locations. We'll get to, well, why don't I go through that right now? Um, shelter in place is, again, inspired by the campfire to be an absolutely terrible idea of where you may be able to safely ride out a fire if something has gone horribly wrong. So there are areas where you might be able to drive, park your car on your way in your evacuation in your neighborhood. It's not going to be comfortable, but it will be survivable. That's the idea there. Um, so if your neighborhood has a currently viable shelter-in-place location, that's, that's a good thing. That makes your evacuation risk rating a little bit lower. <laughs> But a lot of neighborhoods, there's not a clear place to put one. And so for those neighborhoods, that's going to be a first priority as well. Then roadway survivability, that's at eight feet or greater of plane length over a road. And suppression difficulty, which is basically a model that says, based on the vegetation that's here and what we know about how it performs under fire, how difficult is it going to be for firefighters to put down? 
So that's what goes into an evacuation risk rating. And then neighborhood risk rating is really places and structures meant to, to show how kind of the neighborhood might be affected by a wildland fire. So hazard assessments, we did drive-throughs. We didn't look at every single road in every single neighborhood, but we went with Joe to try and get the character of the neighborhood, what are the um, kind of risks, the things like, for example, Harris Park shows up as pretty low risk if you just look at the vegetation models because there's not a lot of vegetation there. There's close homes. So close homes together is something we can pick up in hazard assessment that is actually very risky and very likely to be an issue, but when you look at just vegetation data, you don't capture that. So that's, that's what we're talking about with hazard assessment. Radiant heat, we talked about that. Short range ember cast. Notably, we don't have long range ember cast on here because everyone's <laughs> equally affected. It's everybody. Expression difficulty again, and then structure density. Again, to try and weight those neighborhoods that have high structure density, lower vegetation, Still a lot of risk. So those are those two ratings. <coughs> and here's kind of how it shakes out. And I do apologize, these two are going to be in different, um, but they're going to have different colorations and different legends. Um, one got deleted accidentally by me. <laughs> That's okay. But um, so we're looking at neighborhoods that have ranked out extreme in red, that means that they most likely have four points or higher in most of those um, neighborhood categories, the hazard assessment, structure density, suppression difficulty, gradient heat, and short range overcast. And then we have an evacuation rating. The darkest Red here is extreme, orange is high, yellow is moderate, and there's no low. There's no low in either category. I don't know if any of you caught that. There's no low in either category. No neighborhood is at low risk. What questions can I answer about these diagrams? Will you be discussing shelter-in-place locations more, or is that something that will be addressed for all of us at another time? Can I address that? So we are we are trying to find areas that we can set up quasi-safe areas, uh, but it's going to take some work on within the communities. It's going to be more than we can do, but we are trying to identify those at this time so that we can hopefully save more people. Yeah, and so in the CWPP itself, each neighborhood will get a package here with your rating for evacuation and neighborhood risk. You will get these maps of where you have non-survivable roadways and evacuation pinch points that are not, that are overlaid with that non-survivability. And then you will see your radiant heat and then short range, long range ember cast, along with a shelter in place location in the neighborhoods where it is currently viable. There are neighborhoods, so what we didn't do was kind of rank neighborhoods based on size of shelter in place location um, because then it gets to be a little bit tricky and it may not hold up over time. So if vegetation is not managed. Some of these areas that are currently you could refuge in, if they're not managed, I don't want to have a document where someone drove, or see the, in the news that someone drove to one of these and they, they weren't uh, safe. So these are kind of only to be gone to if told <coughs> during an evacuation. But you will be able to see where the, the location, the kind of proposed general location is. Um, but very, very specifically, we didn't give like a lat long address point. This is um, really for the fire protection district to kind of help you work on them and then work on creating them where there are none in your neighborhood. Was there some, will we receive some indication of how to recognize what might be a, a yeah. 
shelter in place survival goals, but yeah, which is what we need to know. Yeah, so there what. is there is actually a pretty simple mathematical equation that you can do to determine how large, given the slope and the adjacent height of fuels, a shelter in place location would need to be to be safe. Um, which is in the document. Um, it's basically, um, yeah, I, without showing it, it'd be a little bit hard to narrate through, but yeah, we've included how you might identify it doing a kind of simple math. Yeah. Um, couple, couple of questions. Mm -hmm. One is one of the ways to mitigate some of these high risk areas is, is offering the evacuation routes out of that area. Um, we're stuck on, um, especially on CF 43 right way. So uh, right. we have a commissioner in the room, so I just wanted to bring that up. Absolutely. Uh, because uh, that's a conversation that we're going to have with the uh, DOCC going forward. Uh, the other thing is there could be a total breakdown communication. It happens all the time. So uh, being told to go to one of those safe areas. Uh, may not happen. Uh, and we're all potentially going to be totally on our own in the fire making decisions. So knowing what our options are is absolutely essential. We've just got to plan on uh, losing uh, communication yeah. with, uh, with the sheriff and the, and the fire protection right. district uh, if there's a, a high severity fire. Yes. So. Uh, how do, we, how do we factor that into these uh, areas of reference? Great point. Yeah. And for if, just to make sure everyone heard, um, I want to address both points that John made here. One on alternative evacuation routes and options, and the other on a communication breakdown during a wildfire. So for the first one, um, very specifically, we did not utilize any currently proposed alternative routes and Joe I mean if Joe is here every time we've had one of these meetings he's like please don't use them yeah. unless somebody tells you it's okay um, so and that gets to a little bit to your second point um, but we did not uh, model what it would be like and how your risk rating might change with those alternate routes because we don't know when they might happen um, and then for kind of a breakdown in communication, I think that's a great point, and that's one that the Fire Protection District is going to have to work on. Part of the reason of sharing this information of potential shelter-in-place locations, evacuation time, and um, areas that are not survivable during wildland fire is to help your decision-making. Um, but we do want you to be aware that you know the fire protection personnel and the sheriff's department if they tell you you cannot sit in this shelter in place area just because I put it in the document does not mean you should tell them <laughs> what where to stick it. So um, hopefully that addresses your question. But that's something that's gonna have to be worked on for a long time. Communication has been something that's been brought up by the community at pretty much every meeting, and I don't really have the answers for you. That's mm -hmm. a little bit beyond um, the scope of looking at the risk here, but it's certainly an issue we've identified that needs to be addressed. I need to see the hand. I'll go to her in the back. I think she had her up hand up before. Hey, if this is too far afield, you know, topic will be up. Um, you were talking about pinch points. Yeah. That's scary. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but as I drive around, in, we're in Berlin, and in, we see, I, I see plenty of points where people have their lovely, beautiful, native juniper bushes yeah. right there on the roadway. Yeah. And I would think that it's within the right-of-way where if people will not willingly, I mean, we've mitigated our property. we got a gold star in the <laughs> fire department because yeah. I was like, I, I, I am not burning up here. So, um, but I understand, I mean, it's hard to cut down a tree that you love. Is there anything that can be done beyond trying to be persuasive? <laughs> Do you want to address that? Yeah, I was just going to say, if it's in the county right-of-way and it's a hazard, the county will come in and take it out. I mean, 
we have that ability to do that. It's in our right away. It's our dream. So, if you have anything in any areas that you look at and say that could be a real problem, check with our road and bridge, figure out where the right of way is, and then the community can say, hey, look, this is a problem. You need to cut it down. Try to work with them because the county doesn't have a whole lot of money right, to, go, to go cut trees. But when it gets to the point of this is critical for safety reasons, we can start identifying, we can work with Joe. Um, I think we've given the, the fire district permission on our right of ways to go in and cut down anything that is in our right of way that they deem as a hazard. What about the utility company? Like IREA, right on their right away, there's all these juniper bushes. You have to talk to IREA on that. They have a tendency to get the hands Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a worker so much, but IREA, yeah. definitely. And on that note, the um, Park County Public Works and the right away inspectors came to a stakeholder meeting to kind of discuss some of our findings, agreed kind of with what Dick just said. Um, IREA, on the other hand, I could not get to come to a meeting. So if any of you have connections and would like to put this information in front of them, I agree with that. <laughs> you have to walk. Do you have a uh, fire watch person in each uh, neighborhood in the district? So uh, as soon as you get an evacuation, you'll get it first to direct traffic. Because if you have 900 families, the land on jets. This is the time to go. Maybe yeah. You get two cars on the road. It's a traffic jam. Right. Um, <laughs> I don't believe that there is a. Well, you can address that. Maybe I don't know if there's anybody. It's a good no, idea. No, I, I have the same response. You have to my knowledge. Nothing from within the community. The, the evacuation call from the sheriff's office. Yeah. Yeah, and um, there is a really good point to be made here about um, getting the notification on time so you can be out of the neighborhood as quickly as possible. Um, Code Red is a great thing or you can sign up for the uh, reverse 911. Um, please do that. <laughs> I can see another hand over. I was going to mention oh. the Code Red thing as yep. well. And also, this is why we're promoting that, that you get your HOA presidents, POA presidents. There's one thing, mind you, uh, Joe's only going to have so many resources available to actually fight the fire. Same with Park County Sheriff's Office. So as you look at your individual neighborhoods, there's not going to be traffic control available. It's amongst you to, to pretty much make sure. We've already talked about in Elk Creek Highlands, trying to create our own paths you know, to get out and maybe finding responsible parties to make sure that people follow a proper zipper pattern. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows how well it works on 285. Yeah, right. I think yeah. you have one of these choke points in your neighborhood, you know, where you have the juniper's close to it. So, yeah, there's certainly some <coughs> kind of scary pieces of information here, but I'm also hopeful that it might be a new leverage point to talking with people that you want to, you know, convince to cut down some junipers along the road, maybe showing them, hey, this evacuation choke point's right at your house. Are you going to be able to get out? You know, I, I'm hopeful that it will be another talking point. It's obviously always difficult to convince people to get involved who don't want to be involved. There's no magic solution. I wish I could give you one, but there's just not. Um, but hopefully these resources can help be a motivating factor. So let's talk about maybe what we can do about it since we're all feeling maybe a little scared. Because <laughs> um, so I'd just like to breeze through a kind of couple high level mitigation and home ignition zone um, recommendations. There's going to be, there's a lot more nuance to this that even can't even be captured in the full CWPP document. Um, what we hope you can do is take the recommendations in the document and then apply it to your neighborhood. So if it's talking about thinning along a roadway, it becomes, okay, we need to thin in front of Johnny's house and around the bend, overlooking this valley, whatever it is. Um, some of that more specific stuff. 
will have to be prescribed when an actual um, project is it. But I'd like to just talk about some of our recommendations here. Um, and what I mean by home ignition zone is both the structure. So I've been talking about home hardening practices, and we'll go, we'll look at a little diagram of what some of those are, but then also the space beyond it. So this is what you have a lot of control over, right? In some areas, you might not have 100 feet before your neighbor's home, um, but that's okay. You can convince your neighbor to do it with you, right? Linked, defensible spaces are a really, really good thing. So this makes a firefighter's job much more simple. It makes your home potentially defensible and a lot of fire. But if you have things in your home that are not well maintained and you don't have any defensible space, in certain wildland fire scenarios, it's going to be very difficult. It's very, very difficult for firefighters to be able to do anything for your home. So you have a responsibility just like we do. And so let's dive into defensible space a little bit more. You guys seem like a pretty well read crowd, but I just want to make sure that no one in the room is like, what the heck are you talking about? Um, defensible space is kind of removing vegetation, flammable materials. Wood piles from underneath your deck. Anybody guilty of that? <laughs> um, so that your home is not, you're lessening the impact of a flame front coming to your home in a wildland fire. So all defensible space materials talk about different zones, some have different lengths. I personally prefer cal fires, they're much more, they have longer distances in them. Um, but if we can get everybody to do 100 feet, that'd be great. Um, so talking about the, uh, the immediate zone of your house, removing mulch, landscaping, anything that's going to immediately be catching your home on fire. You're also going to be thinking about intermediate. Do you want a tree raining needles into your gutters, or would you rather maybe not? The answer is probably not. <laughs> and then having defensible space with less vegetation around your home. I know a lot of you and a lot of people, like people that you have trouble working with in the community, do not want to cut trees near their home. They want to be private. Their home might not be defensible. So um, that's kind of the, the hard truth of that. And then getting into the home itself, these are some of the bad choices here in red. Like you saw in that video, having those open eaves with embers coming in, um, having mulch at the base of your home is often a big perpetrator. Gravel is a better choice. Um, having single pane windows, anywhere that embers are going to be easier to get into your home. On the right side here in green, <laughs> They're going to talk about some of the examples. These are just some of the choices that you should be thinking about with your home. Um, there's a lot of materials um, that kind of describe some of the more details. Like if you're like, everything I have is great except my deck. You know, there's a lot of materials online to kind of think about decking in particular, how it attaches to your home, what kind of flashing to use. <coughs> I don't want to go into all that right now, but. Um, I just want to make sure that everyone in this room knows what this means, that we're talking about actually changing some of the materials on your home. Any questions about the home ignition zone, defensible space? Okay. You guys already know this. <laughs> so, this is... Um, a little excerpt of what came out of our stakeholder conversation with the U.S. Forest Service, Colorado State Forest Service, uh, Park County Public Works right-of-way inspectors, Denver Water, um, and then the Fire Protection District, who are responsible for a lot of these kind of gray or black hashed areas. Those are planned or completed projects. 
So that's the good news. There's work that's happening in this area. Um, and then in the orange are wildfire scars in the past, which are at the moment helpful in terms of um, places to anchor fuels treatments to, but are not forever. So um, definitely comes with some future mitigation action. But these purple ovals here are where those um, agency stakeholders have decided are kind of really high priority areas for population center protection. So as you guys saw, there's a lot of um, kind of intense fire behavior in the Berland Roland area down there, south of 285, um, all the way down to Lost Acres. And so they identified kind of going along the roadway and improving on some of the work they've already done, connecting it, um, utilizing this as kind of a broad area where they're going to be um, reaching out to private landowners, large ranches, working on U.S. Forest Service land, and prioritizing rights of way. Then again, there's work that is both planned and completed on the southwest side of County Road 43. Um, but it needs to be supplemented because there's a lot of potential for fire to be moving kind of this direction up through here um, beyond the snaking fire scar. So that was another area where the, those agencies felt they both had connections with private landowners and um, the Forest Service had, had funds they could use to work in those areas. Um, the reason why these are kind of not specific treatments is because some of it is going to be up in the air based on if they can get a private landowner to contract. Um, so if you know anyone in those areas, yeah. help them. <laughs> but um, these are kind of areas of high priority for them where they're going to be more aggressively chasing um, some of these contracts. And then again, connecting between the Woodside areas and then Harris Park here. Um, Denver Water in particular was very interested in protecting the Elk Creek Zone of Concern, which is up there. Mm -hmm. um, so there's potential funding for a project like that. Again, all of this, all of these treatments are recommendations. They're based on conversations that we've had, um, but they're, none of them are uh, contracted yet. I share these with you so that you can understand that the agencies in your area, your local partners, are very committed to what's going on here. They looked at your fire risk, and they made a commitment to, to you. Um, but what you need to do is make that commitment back to them and work on your home, your neighbors, you know, smaller treatments that you might have control over. So some of those neighborhood field treatments are all kind of smaller scale field treatments really are the same as any large scale field treatment. It just costs less. <laughs> but what you're trying to do is open up canopy so that when a wildfire happens, canopy is, uh, wildfire is not running through canopy, much harder to control and you're trying to prevent it from getting into the canopy in the first place. So removing ladder fuels that bring fuel up into the canopy, and this diagram doesn't really show, but we recommend a 15-foot tree spacing um, to actually prevent tree-to-tree -tree ignition. When, sometimes you'll see treatments where people have maybe taken out a couple and you still have touching crowns, it doesn't really make a whole difference when it comes to crown fire. Are you talking 15 feet crowns or crowns? Crowns. Crowns. 15 foot crown spacing. This crown fire is activity in Platte Canyon is really high um, and very, it would be very hard to stop during a wildfire. So any neighborhood field treatment, any field treatment at all, it's not bomb-proof, it's not a force field. It's not going to absolutely prevent your neighborhood or your home from catching on fire. 
but it will allow the fire department and first responders more tactical options, and it will decrease fire intensity. So it is a great thing to do, but it must, it must be coupled with defensible space and home hardening, because it's not going to prevent an ember from getting into your home. And so some of kind of, when we talk about this, I think the resistance that a lot of you get when talking with your neighbors, um, or even feel yourself, is that you don't want to cut any trees. But in this landscape, the, the, the vegetation that we have right now in Platte Canyon is not what used to ecologically be here. It's due to 300 years of fire suppression. And ecological forests look a lot more like this. They have spaces in between, they have clumps, they have openings. They're not uniform, they're, they're not even age, meaning same size, really. Um, and what I, what I think is really helpful to have visually in your mind is that if you don't cut trees and you are working in this kind of 300 years of fire suppression, if a wildfire comes through, you're not going to have anything left. <laughs> You're not going to want to rebuild your home there. It's not going to feel like your home. But if you cut some trees, it will still feel like your home. And I, I really encourage you to kind of utilize diagrams like this to kind of understand what both ecological forests look like and function like, and then also the way we can build a more resilient forest type, which is actually the way it used to be. Any pushback or questions on that? Is there any motion from the Forest Service in the direction of ecologically mm -hmm. treating the forest? Yeah. I mean, that you absolutely. said 300 years. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Are we, heading, are we headed to a better place? <laughs> You're absolutely headed to a better place. So the Forest Service staff in your area right now are very, I, I would call them very progressive, um, and are very much wanting to restore the natural forest type and also provide for wildfire mitigation at the same time. It is also 300 years of fire suppression. It's going to take a very long time to um, undo some of that bad action. Um, but I, I, would, I can tell you that they're very committed to that. We're in kind of the diagram that I showed before, some of the areas that they'd like to focus on are where they would like to put money into doing that. Obviously, they would like to do it over the whole national forest, but in a lot of cases, that's not really feasible. Um, so that diagram before was meant to display where they're trying to both think about ecological restoration and wildfire mitigation and prioritizing those population centers. John? Uh, 15 feet at 25 miles an hour. That's still going to be a ground fire. Uh, 15 feet at 25 miles an hour could still be a ground fire, yes. It is, 15 feet is, by the literature, the point where things really start to shift. Um, you actually see, see some momentum change at 10 feet, which is what the state forest recommends. Um, but we find that the inflection point at 15 is where we like to land. Depends on slope. Depends on slope, yeah. I mean, so any fuel treatment needs to be um, in according to slope and local conditions. Um, and yeah, I don't have a diagram in here, but that would have been very helpful to show how bad slope impacts fire behavior. I know some of you probably in here live mid slope or at top of slope. It's not a good place to be. <laughs> um, so work with your neighbors, um, that's all I can really give you on that, but absolutely, I mean, it's not, 15 feet is not bomb-proof, and it's not, it's not meant to be, but it is uh, what we recommend as a minimum thinning standard. What would be a conservative thinning standard? Conservative thinning so standard? So 15, 15 is minimum, uh, and I want, I've got five acres sure. to thin, 
Uh, which I'm thinking there might be a 75 mile an hour wind fire coming my way. <coughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> Just leave that kind of move. So, would I open it up to 30 or 40 feet? Yeah. I mean, I think that, yeah, the minimum is meant to say where we feel that you're going to actually be changing the situation. Um, but opening up further and having larger openings in between trees um, is one, ecologically sound, and two, only going to improve your, your fire behavior. That being said, when you open up an area and you do a thinning treatment, there needs to be maintenance. So when you open an area up, you tend to increase the amount of grass in an area, which increase, which is a fuel type that can be easier to control, but it has quicker rates of spread. So there's, there's trade-offs and there's management um, post-treatment that absolutely needs to happen and needs to be planned for when a treatment is being proposed. And so I, I don't want to go too far into the weeds there, but um, all, a lot of that is written up into the CWPP of the ways that you might be able to maintain a treatment, minimum recommendations where you're going to start to see a difference, um, and then also a nod to the way that um, this forest type was before ecologically. There was large openings, there was like a clump of trees and then another large opening. It's not this kind of contiguous blanket of trees that we kind of expect to see today. If that answers the question. Buddy? Okay. Um, we've touched on this quite a bit throughout, um, but I'll just make a plug here um, for making an evacuation plan. Ready, Set, Go has some resources. Um, Joe Burgett has offered to be of assistance with evacuation plans. He cannot make your evacuation plan for you. You need to make it based on your own considerations. And um, John Van Doren here with Fire Adapted Bailey is a great resource on evacuation planning and really everything we've talked about tonight. Um, but he's been working particularly on evacuation plans, so I want to give uh, you know, direct you to him if you are one of the people who kind of sheepishly didn't raise your hand. Okay, <laughs> any questions on evacuation, fuels treatments in your neighborhood, home hardening? I have a question about um, roads that we need to exit before we get into an evacuation route. Mm. Uh, the whole thing with, you know, cooperative neighbors, well, I happen to live on a road where there's a lot of rental, you know, people oh, rent. Mm -hmm. But how, is there some way that either the county or fire department can notify, red tag uh, properties or that kind of thing, just to let people know they have to call their landlords or whatever to mitigate? Oh, interesting. Um, <laughs> that's a good idea, honestly. <laughs> Uh, there, I don't think there's currently such a program. I don't know if you guys know of anything like that. For, um, uh, renter, renters being able to take kind of some of this information and ask their landlords to mitigate. It, it seems to me it's coming from more official uh, source would make a bigger difference than me going to the neighbor renter and saying, you know, you need to do mitigation, and here's what you need to do. You know what I mean? If it came directly from officials. And part of the, the problem is with home by home, like mitigation advice, is currently in Platte Canyon, there's not really a system for it. It's very expensive. Um, so I would certainly rely on what I'm about to share, which are the next, the couple of resources in the area, including Fire Adapted Bailey and um, the Platte Canyon Fire Protection District and Wildland Fire Module. Um, they can be helpful to you, but they can't come to everyone's property to say, well, these are the trees that would need to go. Um, 
it's, it's expensive to do that, and home by home assessments are something that a lot of different organizations are working on. I know Fire Director Bailey is doing some work on that in the Berlin area. Um, but yeah, it's kind of a challenge that every district that we work with faces. But let me go through here too, talk about this, highlight the State Forest Service and the Jefferson Conservation District. If you haven't already kind of looked into what resources they have available for you, like make you aware. Um, the State Forest Service is really great for educational materials. They have a bazillion publications, um, and some of them are going to be referenced directly in CWPP, um, and then there's there's endless resources online. I trust everything that comes out, um, even though I said the 10 feet, 15 feet thing. Uh, I, I do trust them deeply, and um, the Golden Office would be your guys' office. They are a great group of people. They are super progressive. They have um, kind of highlighted this general area, um, Platte Canyon, Elk Creek, Evergreen, all of these areas as one of their high priority areas. And they've reassigned a forester to um, the Platte Canyon Fire Protection District in particular. So um, a lot more resources there and a lot of the, the guy who's who is assigned here is particularly uh, into going after some of these larger landowners and things and to do some mitigation for the community good. So that's very cool. Um, also, funding is always an issue for mitigation. I don't claim to have all of the solutions for you, but State Forest Service with certain <coughs> projects, if you buy a chainsaw for mitigation, they can give you a tax return sub subtraction. Um, so, just kind of putting that out there, if you hire a contractor for wildland mitigation work, you can get some money compensated by the State Forest Service, so who doesn't like that? Um, they do focus on larger properties. That's not to say that you couldn't give the Golden Office a call to ask them a question, um, but a lot of their resources are focused on bigger tracts of land, 40 acres. Jefferson Conservation District, though, is way more available for site visits, um, and they can provide you technical assistance and connect you with contractors to do work, um, give you kind of some basic site visit um, information. And also, if you do think about, say, doing a forestry project as a neighborhood, they can kind of manage a project start to finish. I mean, they're great. Also, very progressive over there and um, very happy to also come and do education outreach. Come to a meeting, talk about ways you can mitigate. Um, we've got a decent sized staff and they're they're available for kind of some of these site visits. Where are they located? What was that? Where are they located? Oh, they're also located in Golden, I believe. Um, I'm pretty sure they're like right on the street from the State Forest Service, and if they're not, then you, um, they're, they're in the Golden area. They're, they're very close. And then, I don't know if it's really even needed, but I just want to make a plug for Pike Canyon Fire District. They have great staff who can help answer some questions. There's some questions like evacuation planning where you're going to have to make some decisions on your own. They can't write their plan, your plan for you, where exactly you should go, what exactly you should take. Um, but I know that Joe Chief Forget has personally sat down with people to help them think through it. You know, just want to make sure that everyone's just taking a, advantage. Just a comment when the fire department came out, I was really afraid they were gonna, there was a particular stand of trees that I wanted to at least save some up. And I was afraid they were going to say, cut them all down, that's it. And they said, no, 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 you've got more than 30 feet between those trees and the rest of it. Mm -hmm. It's defensible, you've got rid of the grass and the bushes and everything else. So we were able to save that very pretty little group. Mm -hmm. Some of them have to go. You know, out of seven trees, sure. three have to go. But it's still going to be very nice. And I, so I was encouraged by that and a number of other things. I thought it was going to be a whole lot more painful than it was. So. It doesn't have to be a clear cut. So. Yeah. 
No, 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 Shelby, if you want to kind of plug anything for the module or the district at all here. Yeah, uh, I mean, I could probably talk some blue in the face about, about fuels and things like that, but a few of the things that come to mind for me is don't become overwhelmed with the, the neighborhood size treatment things. That's kind of some of the stuff we're dealing with. Uh, make sure you pay attention to the things Crane is suggesting you do on an, on an individual level of hardening your home and defensible space and, and networking to your neighbors um, because that, that goes a long way. Um, Black Canyon, you know, as resources are available, we do offer, and there's kind of some different ways to go about it, to come out and do a free site visit and give you some advice on how to proceed with mitigation. So just reach uh, the fire station here and you know, inquire about that. Um, we're, we're busy with uh, a lot of fuels work, and just as you said, we're working with partners, and you know, we, we hear all the same information you're hearing, and we're trying to do something about it, but we need your help as well, but that's a huge part. And that's, that's the take home that I'd like to make sure everybody gets is part in your home so we can get in there and do something. Great. Thanks. Yeah, I didn't realize you guys did free life of this. What a bonus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd love to give a plug for Fire Adaptive Bailey and the services that they can provide. Do you, one of you guys want to give a shout out? <laughs> sure. Put you on the spot. Uh, uh, I think the uh, most important thing we're doing right now is evaluation planning workshops. We've done one for seniors. We will be using more for seniors. Uh, we're currently working with the school district to do evacuation workshops for parents. Uh, this was a special case. Uh, we have a lot of kids that are home alone uh, for a certain part of the day, school day, uh, with both parents working in Metro Denver. Uh, and during the summertime, we have those same kids uh, at home uh, during the worst uh, part of the fire season here. So uh, that's been a very strong area of focus for us right now. Uh, the other thing, uh, we're working with the uh, uh, Canyon Fire Protection District and our sheriff, Tom McGraw, to take all of this information and use it to inform a comprehensive evacuation plan for the Bay Area. Uh, so and that will then include having deputies to be aware Deputies are from uh, Jefferson County come. Uh, uh, how are our communication systems going to work? Uh, putting all of that together, uh, and actually bringing an outside consultant to, uh, to help us do that because uh, uh, nobody in Park County has all the answers and uh, we need some outside help for this. So, a couple of things coming your way, uh, and uh, all of this information is really going to be helpful to inform. Both the workshops and the evacuation plan. Thanks. So that is my what I got for you guys. Um, I'm sure you all have some questions, um, and I'm let's let's do you know five ten minutes of questions, and then uh, if you all want to talk to me more specifically, you can come up and and do so. Website that we can see all the maps. So yeah, so they will be uploaded on the Black Canyon Fire website. Um, they are not there currently, but um, after these meetings and getting any last bits of feedback from you all, the document will be up there, and all of these neighborhood packages will be up there as well. May I take just a moment? I would like to thank everybody here on behalf of the Platte Canyon Fire Protection District and the board. We do greatly appreciate all of the support that we do get from our community. And we just want to let you know that we're trying to do the best we can for you. And we are really look forward to continuing working with you and the support that we've received from you all over the last well, I can say 37 years. <laughs> so thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. down today I will send it to you personally. Yeah, otherwise it will be on the Fire Protection District website. Pla it's what is it? Platcanyonfire.org, I think. Yeah. Google Platcanyonfire. Yeah. <laughs>
first. But, but yeah, it will be on there. Um, we'll have a main document with information that you can kind of flip through. You can go right to home hardening recommendations, look through some of that. You can go right to your neighborhood. Um, there's information in there that's hopefully helpful to teach you about fire, some basics of fire behavior. Um, but then also, if that's not something you're willing to read, it's it's kind of laid out so that you could um, get the information you want and not be overwhelmed by a really large document. <laughs> okay, thank you. Did you? Yes. Any feedback on content that you are not sure about, how you understand it? or clarification you would want in a final document? <laughs> I did it perfect. <laughs> 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 There's some FireWise materials at the back if you want to take them to hand to your neighbors. You can also come up talk to me about anything else. Thank you so much.